welcome to today's Killen Report. We've got an exciting program for you. We're going to be discussing energy and nuclear energy and renewables and all kinds of things. And I can't wait to get into this. I'm Jonathan Clyde, owner of the Clyde Design Group Fine Custom Cabinetry in Oakland, California. And I've got two very, very distinguished guests I'm delighted to welcome to the program, Dr. Alex Kanara and Dr. Ripu Malhotra. It is a pleasure, gentlemen, to have you. Let me just give our audience a little bit of background. Uh, Alex um, is a nuclear energy and ocean change activist with degrees from Lehigh University and advanced degrees, including his doctor from Stanford University in mathematical systems. And he's worked with a lot of local and national organizations on energy and climate issues and pertaining to uh, clean and safe nuclear power. And that's uh, your background. And Ripu, you received uh, your PhD in chemistry from the University of Southern California. Go uh, great. And uh, you're the author of uh, uh, five books now, I believe, and over 100 articles in scientific journals. And more recently, um, you were the associate uh, director of chemical sciences and technology laboratory at SRI International in Menlo Park. And uh, you also won the 2015 Henry H. Storch Award. And uh, you won that because uh, of your contributions to the field of fuel science and energy technology. So gentlemen, welcome to today's program. Pleasure to, pleasure to have you. Um, let's, let's just dive in, shall we? Um, Ripu, um, can greater energy efficiency and conservation measures allow us to meet global demand for energy without increasing consumption over current levels. What's your thought? Short answer, no. Longer answer? Longer answer, yes. You know, this is often talked about as if it helps. It's, I mean, efficiency and conservation are important aspects. And we have to exercise all those measures. But I don't see, when I look at more than half the world's population living at the level they are, and the need to move towards all electric systems, because they are the cleaner ones, the amount of electrical energy that we need is so large, it'll be about four times the current production levels that we have. So I don't see efficiency and conservation alone helping us with that. Mm -hmm. They could be an important part, but uh, we will have to increase our overall supply many times, many fold, over our current levels. And our current levels are unsustainable, as you know. I, I do understand that. So talk to me just very briefly <clears throat> about renewables. So renewables, what people generally understand with that, are they are the, there's the hydroelectric, there's the geothermal, but mostly people think about wind and solar. And these are the ones that are rapidly increasing, uh, yes, and the prices have come down dramatically, yes. But these last two are also intermittent sources. And we would rather have our systems be uh, a, a, you know, available all the time. We can't have, or we have to uh, spend a lot more money in managing these fluctuations and these long periods when they may not be around. I understand. So it's, it's for the person not in the industry, I suppose it's easy to appreciate the positive attributes of renewables. Yeah. Um, what about nuclear? I think it's a wonderful source of energy for, for us, and it holds one of the best potential going forward. Uh, I know it has a, we have, have a terrible, or a big uphill battle in terms of convincing people to realize that this is a safe and effective and uh, cheap source of energy. It's not going to go away. And it's clean. And it's environmentally one of the most benign ones that's around. Mm -hmm. It's also the safest. But if you look at the uh, when all these benefits derive, start from one little thing, which is the energy density. Mm -hmm. We have to remember that. 
Um, and, and, and maybe, uh, you know, as an example, you always carry something with you, don't you, Alex, <laughs> for energy density? I shouldn't have told maybe, him. Maybe, maybe you can, told him. Can, can show us what that, so, what that means. What, <clears throat> yeah, this is a slug of, it, it could be a slug of pure uranium. It could be or it is? Uh, well, depends on who's watching. I understand. It could <laughs> be, then. So that slug of uranium mm -hmm. is enough to drive all the energy needs that you have or I have or Ripu has for a decade. House heating, flying across the world, driving automobiles, all that kind of thing, running your iPhone. Uh, and, and I guess you need to buy more iPhones now, given Apple stock is having some problems. So this amount of uranium is enough to supply an OECD person's needs for energy for a decade. And when those atoms are split, like Einstein explained to President Roosevelt, we got two atoms. Mm -hmm. And atoms are all the same size as Avogadro, the famous scientist, explained. So we have two of those to find a place to put as waste every 10 years for each mm -hmm. person. Mm -hmm. Not a very big deal. Right? So that's part of the problem with, with nuclear is simply that it's an emotional reaction that people have been trained to have by media and, and uh, you know, anti-nuclear forces in the social But from milieu. the scientific point of view, you're, you're all both confident that nuclear is absolutely from your point of view, a very safe, fine right. form of Absolutely. energy that can be disposed we in can, a way that we, gets... we, we have more radioactive material in coal ash around the various coal plants in the southeast of the United States uh -huh. than we have to worry about from a nuclear plant. Uh -huh. And the other thing that to really get through is that nuclear plants don't have bomb materials in them. They're explicitly required by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and by the International Atomic Energy Agency to have materials in them that are so dilute you could not be making a bomb with them. So this uranium is pure, but when you put it into a nuclear plant, you put in, 90, you put in 20 times more uh, of a material that can't fission, can't be made into a weapon. Mm -hmm. So that part of the nuclear plants fueling is 95% of what's in the plant and it's 95% of what comes out of the plant every five years or so when they're refueling it. And that part of it, that 95%, is perfectly reusable. The French have done this for years. So PG&E is getting a lot of bad press on a number of fronts. From, yes, from yes. the fires yes. to the nuclear plants and now it, it plans to shut down Yes, uh, these yes. these really important sources, the Diablo uh, nuclear right. power plant. Um, it's a very what, foolish thing. Yeah, to do. what's yeah. what? What are your thoughts on on, on well, all of this? Well, I mean, it's the dominant source of clean energy from PG&E is the Diablo Canyon nuclear plant, which produces more clean energy than any other source in California. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's been running that way since 1986, and it runs 90 percent of every year at least. Uh, and it can even be called upon by our ISO, our uh, controller for energy, electric energy distribution in California. It can be called upon to run longer than it uh, was scheduled to run. Right. In 2015, it was called upon to not refuel, but to run for a month or so longer in order to meet... Uh, the state need for a heat wave in air conditioning, particularly in the southern part of the right. state. So when people have uh, when people have a fear of yeah. this and they cite uh, Chernobyl yeah. or they yeah. cite Japan or they cite exactly talk about how to assuage this yeah. and persuade yeah. the general public that yes we're safe. It, it is very hard. I I have. I've had that experience many, many times. I do try to uh, bring back the facts, and maybe I should uh, use my, uh, some other, some of the other skills of persuasion because I've always gone by the logic, mm -hmm. and I know that logic doesn't always work. Mm -hmm. But logically looking at it, if, I, if you look at, uh, uh, say, deaths 
per unit of energy produced. Nuclear has the least, has the fewest. If I look at the materials that are needed, it's the fewest. If I look at, when people bring up Three Mile Island, you remind them, nobody died from it, okay? Its next big disaster was the Chernobyl. First of all, it was not really a commercial power plant like the way we are built that was without containment and all that. And yes, it was a terrible disaster. And it was happened during uh, uh, an unscheduled kind of an experiment that was they were trying to do, things went awry and all that. But still, what has been the, uh, after all these years, what have we learned? Where are all those uh, thousands of deaths that they were talking about? No, we can't detect them. There aren't that many deaths uh, that happened from there. Uh, there were some, about 50 people died immediately from, in, for the, from the acute radiation that they, uh, experience, that they were exposed to when they, when they went into work on the... What about over on, time? Over time, we haven't seen any of those. Actually, the area that was evacuated and now, well, the wild animals and all have come and they are, they are living. Mm -hmm. uh, I, yeah, I'm sure if, I, uh, if you search for them, you'll find... Uh, reports about uh, two-headed frogs or uh, some <laughs> strange things, but I have not seen any scientific peer-reviewed article or a report that shows any of those things. In fact, earlier, using the linear no-threshold theory, uh, which is a flawed assumption that's made uh, often, but it kinds of, it's, a, it's okay to use that to if you want to look at the upper limit. What's the worst scenario? You can get the worst scenario from that. Even in that, they were, we were thinking about uh, a few thousand deaths, premature cancers from the Chernobyl thing, from all the exposures. In a population there, because cancer is so, such a prevalent thing, about 20%, that you know, it's, it's a, undetectable unless mm -hmm. you're looking for things. Mm -hmm. Fukushima is the other one. Nobody died from the radiation. People died from the tsunami. And people died from the mental stress of having been forced, forcibly evacuated from that area and the, the worries about being able to get back or the social stigma of having been exposed. But a lot of it is fears about radiation and they are they're there. <clears throat> mm -hmm. and, and because we don't see it or something, it just, it has that. It evokes that fear which is very hard to get over. I don't want to poo-poo it entirely. Mm -hmm. I, I, mean, I, I recognize people have that fear. Right. But how do I tell them, look at it, nobody died from it. Right. So on a more local level, Alex, why does the utility PG&E want to shut this plant down? Yes, well, uh, California is unusual. Uh, in, in some respects, it's dysfunctional and as far as utilities are concerned because <clears throat> Utilities don't make very much money from what we pay them for their, their electric rates and about our electricity use. What they make money from in California is that the California Public Utilities Commission lets them bill us based upon what's called capital cost recovery. And what CCR says is that if you own a utility, you're better off building new things plants, transmission lines, whatever, and charging your, your customers not only for the capital invested in those new things, but you're allowed to get over 10% interest on them from us, the utility customers. So when you have a plant that's been running, like the Diablo Canyon plant, since 1986, it's depreciated pretty much to zero on the books of PG&E. So they don't really have anything to charge us for capital wise unless they go out and invest in something else. And that's fundamentally the background in California for why utilities do what they do. We actually have more power plants in California than we need because of this, because of this capital cost recovery craziness that lets them get 10% on investments that they're going to get 110% back from us on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The uh, Los Angeles Times, I think, had an article on this uh, some months ago about California having too many power plants. Mm. So they don't care 
they, meaning the utility company, doesn't necessarily care to do anything that is beyond what they're legally required to do. Right. So you had, so you had mentioned the um, uh, the PUC. Yeah. In all of this, it's, so what's what's their thinking? That's the problem. The problem is that the PUC has always been populated by uh, gubernatorial appointments that are related to the power industry. So like the when we had that terrible tragedy in San Bruno when eight people were killed by get, by being burned to death in their own homes uh, because of a gas major gas line that wasn't maintained properly, the National High, uh, Transportation Safety Board found PG&E and, and the CPUC negligent. But the CPUC head wasn't kicked out. Nobody on the CPUC lost their position, even though for 20 or 30 years, documents had been falsified, tests that were supposed to be done on, on the gas lines hadn't been done, or wasn't, weren't reported properly, and all this kind of thing. Just basic, simple collusion amongst the regulator and the regulated. Mm -hmm. And the governor did nothing about it. Interesting. I want to go back to, to the first question that I asked you, which you gave me a resounding no. Usually, I like my first question with a yes. So let me so let me let me try to let me try let me try it another way. Um, solar and wind, yeah, right. Um, it's now often you know cheaper than coal, yeah, right. Yeah. And um, battery costs are coming down, yeah. So why can't renewables and those resources supply all the energy that we need? So you have to think about what does it take to get those energy. I think we were talking about energy density mm -hmm. right, a little right, bit. Right. And I wanted to sh show you the materials requirements for installing a system to harness these wind and solar or something like that is so much more. You, you begin to strain the supplies of basic raw materials like wind, uh, like steel and concrete and copper aluminum, glass. These are the things that our global suppliers have to be increased many, many, many times. And on top of that, if we are going to be turning into an all, you know, relying everything, including our transportation, which is uh, more than uh, about 40% of the, our primary energy consumption comes from, from that, from transportation. If we want to make that also electric, we need a lot more electricity and the the growth that we are looking at as fast as it is it, it pales compared to where we really need to go it, you just have to draw it on a, to look at the scales it's hundreds of times that's uh, that the current levels are okay. and i think we have a, a, at the moment the costs when they're coming down is because they're not including the costs that are associated for uh, managing the the variability mm -hmm. that right. is not included right. so what's going to be put in to be able to to have the power on when the sun isn't there or some so either you triple the amount or you the, of uh, capacity to begin with and uh, have all of them producing and save two of them for the eight, 16 hours that that you may not uh, when sun is not optimal or not there mm -hmm. Uh, things like that, uh, those costs are not exactly being borne at the moment. Mm -hmm. And when you start mm -hmm. looking right. at those, that it gets very, very expensive. So there are problems in terms of the production of the energy density of, of uh, renewables. They're closing power plants. That's not so good. No. So in, in the bit of remaining time that we've got, tell me, what are you guys optimistic about well, all of this stuff. Uh, okay, so that's that's pretty straightforward. So we're optimistic about educating people, the average person. Because if the average person is educated, they can't be fooled by the wind and solar people, for instance. As Ripu said, even, even the uh, owner of Berkshire Hathaway, who has invested in wind, said that without the subsidy, they wouldn't do it because it doesn't make any sense. So the wind industry, in fact, is making money off everyone because everyone subsidizes the few that are involved in the industry. And if that subsidy went away, 
there wouldn't be any reason to install the windmills. Same for the solar PV systems. Solar is even more special because it's not a completed engineering project. It's not really a finished project, product. Uh, it, it, create, it wastes 80% of the sunlight. Mm -hmm. So you wouldn't buy a car that wastes 80% of the gasoline you put it in. Right, right. But solar panels waste 80% of the sunlight that falls on them as heat, plain old heat. But we're supposed to be against global warming. So why would we want to install something that's going to take 80% of the sunlight falling on a given square mile and convert it into heat? So there's, there's this belief, unfortunately, that's been propagated into the average person's thinking that somehow wind and solar are, even though they're low energy density, they're able to supplant constant energy sources like coal, oil, nuclear, hydro, and so forth. So what we have to do is educate people to think about, well, what are we really trying to do? We're trying to eliminate combustion and the effluence of combustion, CO2 and, and other things. And we want to have a utility quality source of energy. And, and that's what we expect because before all this business about global warming and, and uh, renewables, uh, we had utilities. We had 24-7 power. We had 24-7 water. We had 24-7 uh, police, fire sewer somehow electricity now because of this existence of a solar panel or a windmill now somehow people are being convinced that well now we can do, deal with these variable sources which are very expensive as Rupa was pointing out to back up california has so much solar energy at noon time that we pay other states to take it mm -hmm. it's negative pricing we still subsidize the solar installer but we <laughs> charge our citizens not only for the subsidy but to pay utah or nevada to take the solar i, I don't excess. know how optimistic we should be how about you what do you what, so what, 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 there, are a few, your, there are a few it's, things it's ridiculous that, the, the, uh, for me the optimism comes from the fact that i can understand the skewed market in the u.s and in particular california doesn't allow this but elsewhere it's not stopping. Mm -hmm. I'm encouraged by the fact that China right. and India right. and Korea are building. Korea is building nuclear power plants at a very cost-effective manner. And, you know, they, they are, their prices are really down. And, I mean, that's because they're building and so the prices are coming down. There are many newer, newer technologies that are walk-away safe. That gives me hope. Right now, what we can do is, uh, in California, first of all, is something that you may have heard before, Someone described, if you find yourself in a hole, the first thing you do is you stop digging. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We are really short of uh, clean energy. Right. And we are, you know, closing Diablo Canyon is something like digging deep, deeper into the hole. 18 terawatt hours of good, clean energy out of the, uh, what we need. We, and we have closed San Onofre. We need to start uh, a few simple actions that we can take is, first of all, give nuclear the same kinds of subsidies or credit for producing clean right. CO2-free energy that wind and solar get. It'll make them uh, more competitive. Number two, start building, reopen these plants and start building some. We'll learn from them, we'll experience, and, and with the experience, the prices will come down. Yeah. And three, do some R&D in the more advanced ones right. and see that they can they can happen. That's that's what gives me the optimism. Well, well, I'll tell you what gives me optimism is the fact that in or on beginning on um, February sixteenth, <laughs> okay, um, Art Ventures Gallery in Menlo Park is going to be having a series featuring uh, paintings by our mm -hmm. friend Michael Killen mm -hmm. and various speakers. And it's come to our attention that both of you probably at separate times will be having the opportunity to educate uh, some members of the public who, who we hope will come and see you with this message. That's an optimistic thing. That at least makes me feel kind well, of good about it. Good. Thank the, you so the, much. And yeah. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, yeah, the other part of this to be optimistic about is that it's becoming clear that we risk national security by not mm -hmm. 
implementing. I think the Pentagon s uh, said that that was one of the very first thing. The energy yeah. or lack of it lack. is really a national security and international issue. economic mm -hmm. viability. Because yeah. if I had a, a marketing international marketing manager from China's largest nuclear power plant uh, constructor lean over to me at dinner a couple of years ago and say, we intend to dominate world nuclear power. Mm -hmm. Again, I want to end on an optimistic note, but yeah, that's, well, that's, that's okay. That's why we know that. The, for the world. We can do it. <laughs> and one of, the, one of the other things that's, that's, that's coming up that's going to be great also, featuring uh, some of artwork of Michael Killen, yeah. is the uh, uh, Silicon Valley um, Energy. Energy Summit yeah. uh, on June 21st. Yeah. Which is a big deal. Do you guys do you guys go to that? Is that something? Sometimes that I go so, he, he I, goes I go regularly. There. I have I have occasionally gone. You yeah, and and so I'm sure there are a lot of uh, great minds, obviously, and a lot of wonderful things that are being bantied around and talked about. And this obviously these ideas will ferment and and hopefully come you know mm -hmm. to fruition. Mm -hmm. it, it's always always a pleasure to have such wonderful guests and have the opportunity to be able to speak with wonderful people like yourselves that are really making and continuing to make a big, big difference in all of our lives. I'd like to thank you, Alex Canara and uh, Ripu Malahorta, for um, being with me and giving me this opportunity to speak with you a little bit uh, on this very, very important subject. Thank you, gentlemen, very, very much. And to all of you out there, thank you so much for watching this edition of the Killen Report, and again, many people behind the scenes that are so helpful and give so much to us. We thank them very, very much for being part of our family. I'm Jonathan Clyde, owner of the Clyde Design Group in Oakland, California. Have a good day. <laughs>